Okay, thanks for coming along, everyone. Um, so yeah, so this is something I've been spending a lot of time thinking about over the last few years is multilingual programming, how we get computers to talk multiple languages. Um, and it's a little interesting how I ended up coming to care about this. And it mostly boils down to these five little words, courtesy of Green. around 2005. And those five words come from PEP 3100. Uh, so Python Enhancement Proposal 3100, which is the place where Guido put all of the proposals for Python 3 that were considered non-controversial. Like nobody thought they were a bad idea. Um, so we just, they, that, that was just a list of these are all the things we already agree we're gonna do. This was one of them. Uh, and so Guido started that Python 3 project in earnest back in 2006, uh, and the Python 3.0 release was in 2008. Six years later, <laughs> we're, um, we're, we're still working through some of the issues caused by this particular change. Pretty much everything else we can automate and deal with, uh, it turns out this particular change reveals a whole lot of fundamental data modeling bugs uh, in Python applications. Uh, and fundamental data modeling bugs in the standard library as well. Um, and so yeah, and so this is one where there is no magic wand you can fix. Yeah, no magic wand you can wave to fix your application. You have to actually figure out what's binary data and what's text and make sure you're using the right type for the, for the different roles. And so, but it's also worth asking, why did we change it? Um, now, the honest answer would be because it seemed like a good idea at the time, uh, but the, 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 with the benefit of hindsight, we've actually seriously asked the question of, well, was this a change worth making? Um, and even with all the work it's caused over the last half a decade, uh, we do still think it was worthwhile, and we do still think it was a necessary change to make uh, for the future of Python as a language. Um, and what it fundamentally boils down to is that Python 2 really deeply and fundamentally assumes English. Um, there, there's a lot of aspects of it that simply don't handle other languages. One of the fundamental ones being identifiers, that, that all of your identifiers in Python have to be representable in ASCII, which basically means English. Um, and that actually becomes a real problem when people are starting to do a lot of data-driven programming. They, if they're getting attribute names from column headings in data tables and that sort of stuff. That works fine if your data is all in English, but if you're talking Japanese place names, you're talking the names of Chinese people, um, ASCII's just not gonna cut it anymore. Uh, in Python 3, all of that stuff is all Unicode, uh, and so it will work just as well for Chinese and Japanese data as it will for English. And then, and so what it meant was that things that previously you really needed a sophisticated additional framework around Python to deal with, Python 3 can deal with at a, at a language level. And one of the other aspects is that Python is really, really popular as a teaching language. Uh, and if you look uh, online, there's a, when the Portuguese version of Stack Overflow came out, uh, there was a really good post they did explaining why they decided it was worthwhile having a Portuguese Stack Overflow. Uh, and what it boils down to is that people shouldn't have English, people shouldn't have to learn English in order to learn programming. Uh, and an awful lot of the information out there about programming and the tools we use for programming is in English because so much of it was driven from the United States. Um, and so by changing the default in Python, what it means is that even though the keywords are still um, uh, derived from English, they can just be kind of taught as these are the magic tokens that you use to make, to make the computer do things. Uh, and all the variables and all the function names and all that sort of stuff that are used for the teaching process can actually be in somebody's native language. They don't have to learn directly with the pure English versions. Uh, and so what it means is that, yes, the English the English assumption default will be there for the global collaboration side of things, but it's not a it shouldn't need to be a barrier to entry. It should be possible for people to get started in native language and then pick up the English parts as they need them and as they find them useful. 
And so one of the reasons why this seemed such an obvious thing for us to be doing uh, is that it's actually just one small part of a much larger pattern uh, in the way we've been trying to evolve the way computers and humans interact. Um, and that's basically trying to get computers to be much better at compu communicating with humans um, in the term, in, on human terms. So instead of humans having to learn how to deal with the limitations of computers, uh, get computers to be much better at dealing with the richness and complexity of human communication. And this is where it gets, this is where it turns out the history of this actually goes back long before the rise of the modern computing environment. Because we actually started working on this communicating between humans problem with technology uh, long before co programmable computers were invented, uh, or at least usable ones. Uh, and that actually has an impact on a lot of the technology we use today. And that's the telegraph. It's like the telegraph, some aspects of the very latest version of the Unicode standard date back to the invention of Bordeaux code almost 150 years ago. Um, and in the keynote this morning, you might have seen the TTY device on the Unix machine. TTY, short for teletypewriter. So the teletypes that we use to send telegraph messages are the origin of that TTY abbreviation in POSIX. And that Bordeaux code that was invented in the late 19th century uh, was adopted by Western Union for telegrams in 1901 uh, and then became the ITA2 standard uh, in around about 1930. And so ITA2, five bit encoding. So five bits per character, which wouldn't give you much space to play with. Um, and so it's actually a modal encoding where you can actually send a character that says, switch how you're interpreting this. Um, and the two modes that it offered were letters and figures. Uh, and so letters would send, you would be sending uppercase English alphabet, um, and then you could switch to figure mode to send things like numbers, punctuation, all that sort of stuff. Um, this this, this uh, encoding is actually still in use today. Uh, and one of the big reasons for that is if you go to HF radio circuits, you're talking like bit rates down around 50 to 300. On a really, really good day, you get, might get up to 19.2K. Um, and when you're talking those really low speeds down around the 50 bit per second mark, you can't afford the 60% overhead that an 8-bit character encoding gives you. Um, you actually really, really need those extra bits. Um, and so when I was saying that you can see the shadow of this in, uh, in modern encodings, if you look on that chart, you can see null is there, line feed is there, space is there, carriage return is there, uh, the ASCII bell is there. Um, the inquiry who are you code is there. You can find all of those are still there in modern ASCII and hence in modern Unicode. Um, and so, and in this, back at this point, space was considered a control character rather than, rather than a um, printable character. Um, and there's actually even a Russian derivative of this which actually adds a third mode, so you can get Cyrillic characters. However, ITA2 has quite a few problems. Uh, and one of the big ones is, of course, that it's quite limited, uh, that, that you've, only, you've got less than 60 bits, uh, less than 60 characters to play with. Um, and so by the early, early 1960s, computer engineers were really looking for more characters. Uh, they wanted to get lowercase letters in there, uh, they wanted to get more symbols, they wanted to get more control codes. Uh, as as, um, display, as displays got, simple, got more, more sophisticated than the, than the te telegram tape, uh, you needed more, more display options. Uh, and so they came up with this American Standard Code for Information Interchange. So ASCII, still very, very widely used. Uh, and so ASCII avoided one of the problems with modal encodings, uh, with modal encodings, uh, if you lose the shift character, so like if, 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 you, if you get an error that means you don't read that, that character telling you to switch, switch to figures mode, um, you're now completely confused because you're interpreting it as letters when they're actually sending you figures or vice versa. 
Um, and so they got rid of that because it makes transmission, uh, it, it causes problems with transmissions. Um, they actually considered the idea of doing an 8-bit encoding straight away. Uh, and one of the uh, benefits that would have given them is there's a system called binary coded decimal, uh, which basically just uses four bits to encode a, uh, to encode a decimal digit. Uh, and if you do an 8-bit encoding, then that nicely aligns that you can encode two digits as, as um, two binary coded decimal numbers. Uh, and IBM's EBCDIC does exactly that. Um, however, back in the 1960s, transmission channels were still slow enough that the 14% overhead of that eighth bit, they went, yeah, you know what? No, nah, let's, let's stick with seven, seven data bits, one parity bit. We'll fit it all nicely in an eight bit slot uh, and we'll save 10, 14% overhead. Um, and so, yeah, and so we can, well, you probably can't see that. It's probably too small. Uh, but the ITA2 control characters are still there. Um, ITA2 originally had the British pound sign in it. This ASCII comes with the dollar sign. Um, the, if, if you dig into the details of this, there's actually quite a few really interesting details around the layout um, in that some of them, some of them are related to making sure that a single bit error can't swap a particular character for another one. Uh, so, so they, they, the the layout of the ASCII grid is not random. It, it's there, there's there's stuff in there around making particular operations, only checking checking or flipping one or two bits. Um, so yeah, so it's if you dig down into the details of this sort of stuff, there's actually all sorts of communications engineering stuff related to what this looks like on the wire and what the consequences are of a single bit error rate. However, like ITA2, very, very English, uh, very, very English specific. And so, yeah, so ASCII was great if you spoke English, not so great otherwise. And so people said, well, it's only using seven bits. Computers are good at dealing with eight bits. What can we do with those extra 128 characters? And so what happened was people started coming up with different extended ASCII formats where they'd keep the the low order seven bits compatible with ASCII, and then come up with other extensions like Latin one, this kind of thing that would let them deal with European languages, Cyrillic languages, that kind of thing. However, adding an extra 128 characters isn't gonna really help you deal with Japanese. It's not gonna help you deal with Chinese. It's not gonna help you deal with Korean. That, that for the Asian countries, even extended ASCII just wasn't anywhere near good enough for what they needed. And so we had an explosion in the number of language codecs. Um, and if you really, if you want to find widely used ASCII incompatible codecs, the place to go look is Asia, particularly East Asia. Um, things like Shift JIS, Big Five, ISO 2022. ASCII and extended ASCII just didn't meet the needs of Asian countries, that, that they could not do computing with ASCII and extended ASCII. Uh, and so they came up with their own solutions. Um, and that if you look in the Python standard library, um, back in 2005 for Python 2.4, uh, one of the most frequent requests was um, Hyashik Chang was maintaining a set of codecs called the CJK codec, CJK codex for Chinese, Japanese, Korean. Um, and this was basically a big codec set that handled all these, all these different encodings that were in popular use in East Asia. Um, and so they were merged into Python 2.4 in 2005, and since then Python's been able to deal with them all. Um, and if you actually go look at the standard library for Python 3.4, you'll find there's actually almost 100 different language codecs in there. So, so at this point, we're like going, okay, well, everybody's got codecs that can deal with their languages. Everybody can talk to computers, everybody can use computers. So problem solved, right? We're all fine. Well, not so much. What the, what the um, diversity of codecs gave us was that it essentially let people use their computers in their own language. But the computer had to kind of be in a particular mode. So this was Windows code pages, POSIX locale encodings, and what it let you do is it let the computer deal with English, because that was usually the language of the operating system. 
uh, and it let with it deal with the language of the local users. That works okay if we never have any mechanism that lets different computers talk to each other. Um, so as soon as you network, as soon as you networked computers, as soon as you used portable media to move stuff between computers, these incompatible encodings started breaking down. Um, and then the other thing that turned out to be really problematic was that if your task is to say translate from Japanese to Chinese and your Chinese data is in one encoding and your Japanese data is in a different encoding, well, how do you represent that in a single document? How do you put those translations next to each other? And so this bilingual computing era, which is unfortunately still alive and well today, um, actually turns out to have a lot of really, really hard engineering problems in it. That, that keeping track of this data is in that encoding and this data is in that encoding. Uh, and if you, you can't actually really merge that data together, you have to keep it tagged, you have to keep it separate. Um, that can be done, but it's very, very hard to work with. And so what people realized we actually needed was this idea of multilingual computing. Any language, any time. Well, more accurately, all languages, all the time. A universal way of representing any human language in the world. And ideally, given how much of the infrastructure of the computing world was powered by ASCII at this point, a way of getting from ASCII to the new world order. And so, courtesy of Apple and Xerox, or at least some engineers at Apple and Xerox in the early 90s, we came up with this notion of Unicode. And so it's designed to be exactly that, a universal encoding that can deal with every language in the world all at once, all together, current languages, historical languages, all of them. That's what it is today. It's not quite where it started. Where it started was actually an attempt to just deal with the languages that were in current use in the world in the early 90s. And the reason they did that was because if they limited their target to that set, then they could get away with a 16-bit data format. Because if you include all languages, including all historical languages, it's not going to fit in 16 bits. But they did a vocabulary search and said, no, 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 all the popular modern characters, including kanji and Han and all that sort of stuff, you can you can get away with 16 bits. What they missed was that that only works if you exclude all the proper nouns. If you leave out names, if you leave out places, then yes, a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of kanji and han characters that are not used. Those things do appear in place names and they do appear in people's names. Uh, and so understandably, uh, a lot of people went, well, no, the 16-bit Unicode is not a universal encoding because it can't write my name. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I think it was about three years from when the initial 16-bit one came out to when they went, okay, here's a new version which uses 21 bits storing up to 22, as uh, stored in up to 32 bits for storage. Uh, and that one actually was universal. It, it, was, it expanded out, it included all of, the, all of the place names and all of the people's names that didn't fit into the original. So, we have a universal encoding. Everything's fine, we just all use that and it's all happy, wonderful, and don't need to worry about anything ever again, right? Yes, no. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, so yes, so even the rise of Unicode hasn't ended the codec wars. So, we'll ignore the question of all the existing infrastructure that has been around since long before Unicode existed and we've got to try and modernize it. Um, so that's a, that's a massive problem in its own right. But even within the universe, uh, even within the limits of the universal encoding, um, we have the issue that choosing how to represent text in memory, on disk, and for transmission over the wire is actually really quite a complicated engineering problem. That, that your best choice is actually going to vary depending on what systems you're trying to interoperate with, what kind of data you're going to be transferring, um, what kind of bandwidth you have to play with, what kind of memory, 
what kind of algorithms you're trying to use to process this data. Uh, however, we have at least got down to the point where there's three codecs that will pretty much cover most use cases you're likely to have. Uh, and that's the three on the screen. So I'll go, I'll go into each of those in a bit more detail. So if you go online and search for UTF-8 everywhere, there's, there's a sign that tries to make the case, uh, there's a site that tries to make the case of just use UTF-8, always use UTF-8, don't worry about anything else. They actually have a fairly reasonable point, particularly if you're doing network programming. Um, so UTF-8, single bytes for ASCII code points, um, up to four bytes for other code points. Uh, but it, can, it is a universal encoding, it can represent every Unicode code point. And one of its key, its major advantage over any of the other encodings is that it's uh, ASCII compatible. So, so that you can, f if you drop pure ASCII data into a channel that expects, that expects UTF-8, everything will be fine. Um, the other really nice thing about UTF-8 is that if your data is ASCII heavy, um, so there's lots of components that are pure ASCII, uh, then UTF-8 is going to be the most efficient of the universal encodings. Um, and that's particularly important in network programming because an awful lot of network protocols, the, for easier debugging, the network protocol components themselves are written in ASCII. Uh, so things like SMTP, HTTP, um, HTML, XML, all of those, the, the meta characters that, that define the structure of the protocol, they're all ASCII data. Um, and so it ends up being the case that when you're transmitting over the wire, you're sending a lot of ASCII data, and so UTF-8 is really quite efficient. Um, so according to Google's data, this actually became the most populous, popular encoding for public HTML sites back in 2008. Um, so coincidentally, around about the same time that Python 3 was released, switching Python's default. Um, and so yeah, and so this is the preferred local encoding on POSIX systems, including Mac OS X. Uh, and in the mobile world, we see it in iOS, uh, and it's also native mode Android, because Android's Linux under the hood. However, it would be nice if we could all just use UTF-8 and forget all the others, but life's not that simple. Um, and so one of the things that came out of that initial attempt at defining a 16-bit only Unicode uh, is this idea of the basic multilingual plane. The basic multilingual plane, in fact, is that those really are the most common characters in the world, that, that those 65,000 characters, or sorry, those 65,000 code points really are the most commonly used ones. Um, and so UTF-16 Little Endian uses all of those, represents all of those characters as two bytes, whereas in UTF-8, some of them will take more than two. And so what that actually means is that if your data is not, um, if your data is not ASCII heavy, if it's like genuinely a pure Chinese text or a pure Japanese text, um, UTF-16 can actually be more efficient. That, that, that it will actually store, it will actually take less space um, as uh, UTF-16 data than it would as UTF-8. And so this, this is one of those things where it's potentially a better format for local storage of documents and actually working with human, more human focused stuff rather than communicating between computers. Um, and so this is actually the preferred local encoding on Windows, uh, the .NET CLR, which is now cross-platform, uh, as well as on the Java virtual machine. So those are all UTF-16 environments. Um, the LE refers to Little Indian, which is just Again, it's mostly Intel's fault. Um, <laughs> um, and then you also, uh, but even when you go to the mobile space, you can't get away from UTF-16 LE uh, because the Dalvik and Art runtimes on Android are derived from the JVM, uh, share some similarities with the JVM. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see the UTF-16 show up there as well. So, so even in the mobile space, we have this war between the UTF-8 and the UTF-16 that, that you, you can't get away from it. You, you, if, you, if you want to be truly cross-platform, you end up having to deal with both of these. Um, however, there's, if that's not enough. Can that encode everything like UTF-8? 
Uh, yes, so that's, so there is an actual subtle difference between UTF-16, which can encode everything, uh, but it does it by splitting uh, some characters across two, so, so it will sometimes use four bytes for things. There's another encoding called UCS2, uh, which is strictly only the 16 bits, and it can't encode everything. Uh, so UCS2, if you go outside the basic multilingual plane, it will go, I don't understand it. Um, this is actually a real source of bugs in applications. Uh, so particularly if you try to use Python 2 on Windows um, and try to deal with characters outside the basic multilingual plane, Python will tell you that your single character string actually has two characters in it. Uh, and that's because Python 2 doesn't deal with this properly. Uh, it, it actually is buggy when dealing with characters outside um, the multi, basic multilingual plane on Windows. Um, and that's, that's actually a pretty common thing because, because those 65,000 characters cover so much data, um, it is actually, unless you deliberately put test data in that is uh, outside the basic multilingual plane, um, yeah, you're, not, you're likely not to notice that your algorithms aren't coping with it correctly. Which actually brings us into the next point quite well. Uh, so UTF-32 is the one where you say, look, I don't care about space efficiency. Um, I'm just going to use four bytes per character, all of them, even if, most of my even if most of those bytes end up being zero. And the reason this is still useful is that computers are still really, really good at processing regular arrays. Like computers really like dealing with data, which is a fixed number of units of a fixed size. It's like there is an awful lot of algorithms that only work on data in that format. Uh, and the string, processing, the string processing algorithms in CPython are some of them. <laughs> um, and so what this gets down to is the fact that both UTF-8 and UTF-16 are variable width encodings. That, that the amount of space that they take up in, when stored varies depending on their value. The beauty of UTF-32 in relative to those two is that it's a fixed width encoding. It's, it doesn't matter what the value of the code point is, it's always going to take four bytes. And when it comes to designing your algorithms for string manipulation, that's a really powerful simplifying assumption that, that when you do that, if, if you can assume a fixed width encoding, then you can take the same algorithm and apply it across, across the full spectrum of data, regardless of whether you're using 8 bits, 16 bits, or 32 bits. Um, you can use the same set of algorithms. Uh, and this is actually why Python 2 is buggy uh, in certain, uh, on Windows, is because when Unicode support was added to Python, a lot of the algorithms that were orig originally written for dealing with 8-bit strings were ported directly to dealing with Unicode strings. Uh, and so that works fine if you're storing your Unicode as UTF-32 because it's still a fixed width encoding. When Python 2 stores stuff internally as UTF-16, which it can depending on your build options, you end up breaking that assumption of a fixed width encoding, which means the algorithms sometimes give the wrong answer. Uh, and so what this allowed, um, and so yeah, and so that's why UTF-32 is still around, or that's why UTF-32 is useful, is that even though it's expensive in terms of memory consumption, uh, it's uh, useful in terms of um, uh, simplicity. I think I've actually gone way over time. So. Uh, oh, well, last slide anyway. Uh, so looping back to what got me into this in the first place is the Python 3 connection. Um, is that, yeah, this, our involvement in this kind of got, came out of Python 3 becoming far more opinionated about the right way to handle text data. That, that we took what the folks had figured out in the GUI world, folks, and in the web programming world and said, you know what, you're right, we need to deal with text that way. Let's break that into the core data model of the language. Um, and so this has actually got us to a point where user space processing is largely in a good place. I've had a lot of people say to me, 
oh, okay, uh, this finally makes sense to me now, that they'd never really quite understood how Unicode was supposed to work from the way Python 2 dealt with it. But after learning Python 3, they were able to go, oh, okay, now I understand. And we're able to take that back and apply it to Python 2 as well. Um, that said, it's still not perfect. Uh, we still have a lot of work to do uh, on Windows. We're still using some of the legacy Windows APIs that don't deal with Unicode properly. And so we need to get rid of those and actually use the new Unicode ones. Um, POSIX environments will sometimes tell you the wrong thing uh, and say, oh yeah, yeah, everything's ASCII. They're wrong, uh, but Python 3 will currently still believe them. Uh, uh, and so we need, to, we need to get better at dealing with that. Uh, and then the other thing was that when we redesigned some of the core data types for Python 3, uh, we had some interesting decisions to make to say whether is that an operation that makes sense for binary data or is it only, does it only make sense for text? Uh, and we actually erred on the side of taking things away. Um, uh, taking things away on the binary side. Uh, and the reason, our reasoning for that was that we didn't know uh, because we'd been using Python 2 ourselves for a very long time. We were very used to that way of working. And we weren't sure which which made sense. Uh, and so we're happy with the text side. We were just going to do that exactly the way Python 2 Unicode worked. Uh, but the Python 3 binary side was new. Uh, and so we erred on the side of taking things away because adding stuff back uh, is a lot easier than saying, yeah, we shouldn't have taken that away in the first place. Uh, and so Python 3.5 actually has a few things coming back. So like uh, printf style formatting for binary data, that kind of thing is coming back in Python 3.5 because we have a lot more experience with the new model now, and that's uh, stuff we want to add. Um, and so that's it. Um, do we have time for questions? Or? We're really tight, so yeah. everyone can catch you at lunch. Yes. That'd be really good. So, hope that was useful.